let's let's talk tell me about what you eat again so my meals in a day usually start off with eggs i usually do five organic or free range eggs sometimes six um depends what i'm doing at the moment in, in terms of like cutting things out adding things in i might add a bit of cheese to that or i might mm-hmm. add some maybe, maybe even a beef burger sometimes or some a beef sausage like that you know um that's usually about 7 38 o'clock my next meal's at about 11 usually and that is nearly the moment always beef mince with some butter maybe an egg next meal the moment the same next meal near enough the same and the final meal is um usually some oily fish like mackerel with some eggs mm. maybe with like a little beef burger or something so i'm i mean essentially beef eggs mackerel and i'm eating probably just over 300 grams of butter a day at the moment so wow 300 grams yeah. of butter yeah I'm, I'm heavily stocked in the butter department yeah, you know, that's kind of one of my go-to fats too. And a lot of people use tallow or lard or duck fat or whatever. And I just, the rendered fats, I just noticed didn't digest as well. Mm. And, uh, but butter always seems fine. So, so yeah, I'm down with the butter. I don't eat a lot of it. And the same thing with cheese, you know, add a little cheese, but it's not really a food group. It's, it's, it's a very small part of my diet, but I do enjoy the cheese on the meat too. You get that, yeah. I guess it's fair to say that uh, our food pyramid is essentially like uh, meat, maybe eggs, mm-hmm. at the top like cheese, seafood, maybe. I mean, you have it every day. Um, I wanted to ask you as well about that. So, you have a lot of seafood in your diet, or you have an amount of it at least, you know, from uh, as a shrimp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I wanted to on, ask basically for your like diet journey. You've been doing it quite a few years now, so you can give a good perspective on it. And you know, you know, you've tried different things probably and worked out what doesn't doesn't work so what are you finding are the biggest impacts in your diet at the moment so is it that you're eating more beef rather than chicken or more uh, more shrimp rather than eggs or you know what are the the differences well it became clear that you know um beef eating the the vast majority of my my meals from beef was optimal for me it would probably be the same if I was eating goat or, or sheep or something like that, some kind of lamb, but they're, they tend to be hard to get and expensive. Um, and unless I want to buy the, I could walk down the street and buy the whole animal, <laughs> but if I go to the store, it's imported, you know, and mm-hmm. it's expensive. Um, and then I noticed, you know, I like chicken. Okay. Especially like a rotisserie chicken, but um, they, it wasn't as sustaining, you know, I have to eat a lot of damn chicken to get anywhere. So, um, and I prefer the beef. I mean, most of it's like personal preference. Uh, with the things I like to eat, will they do the job? And yeah, so um, from there, I just kind of looked at it like how much fat versus how much um, protein do I need? You know, and I gradually drifted into higher protein. And, and, and sometimes when you're eating really high protein, really lean meat, you do have to add a little fat in. And for me, it's either... You know, if I'm cooking, it's butter. If I'm not cooking, I use like um, cream cheese or uh, sour cream. And that's mm-hmm. mostly out because I like them and they're convenient. You know, I can take them with me. Um, I could buy it in bulk and have it in the fridge. You know, those those are my, because I like, I try to only go to the store like once a week if I can, maybe twice because I'm busy and I'm usually got to time that in between work and getting home or the gym or whatever so Mm. so yeah so i know a lot of people that don't do dairy and cream cheese doesn't you know they look at it like uh processed uh dirty food or whatever but i don't notice any negative and and uh, like it's not a major part of my diet it's it's like the cheese or anything else like an add-on yeah yeah so sometimes i notice like oh i haven't been eating enough fat i can tell and so add that in so and the eggs are has been kind of up and down. I've been trying to figure out what the right amount is. And um, it's easy for me to drink, you know, like raw eggs. I like to just put them in a cup and and break them up, you know, so they're mm-hmm. consistent. Sometimes I add a little water or something to thin it down. Um, but cooking them, a lot of times I just don't have time except on the weekends, you know. So I do like scrambled eggs. I'll throw bacon mm-hmm. or pastrami or whatever in there, you know, a little cheese, you know so yeah i mean it sounds like me like you 
like to sort of mix it up a little bit and people say there's not much variety in a carnival diet but like how many types of cheeses are there how many types of meat are there mm-hmm. like, it's not just chicken eggs you get duck eggs quail eggs bantam eggs geese eggs there's probably a lot more i've not come up with um ostrich eggs <laughs> i don't know whatever people can get nowadays um but yeah i mean i think i'm always quite skeptical and everyone whenever anyone online says i've been eating um two ribeyes a day for the last five years i'm like so you're telling me your body's been exactly the same for the last five years and your body has needed exactly that much every single day for the last five years Down yeah I think that's where the intuitiveness of the carnival diet comes along so you'd intuitively have more eggs or more shrimp or your body will tell you so i think that's very intelligent yeah i think what happens is most people when they start they do really well on higher higher fat and then actually once they can absorb all that fat um they're like feeling great they're healing up they're getting better but and then and i think they expect to stay there but um i think it's quite clear that we're as uh you know everything's healing up your body's always adapting to what's going on right and in a lot of ways it becomes more efficient and so i'm thinking what happens is a lot of people actually need more protein and less fat at least in a ratio form as time goes on because they're absorbing more fat they're utilizing more fat Mm. and then um they're not wasting as much of it and then and then as they heal up and they become more efficient the the diet needs to change a little bit and so i think a lot of people are uh kind of protein deficient and part of that might be because so many people came from keto you know, it's all fat, it's uh, moderate protein, you know, very low carbohydrate. And, and in their minds, they think, oh, if I eat too much meat, my glucose is going to spike and my insulin is going to go mm-hmm. up and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when you exercise regularly, that's part of the process, right? People are shocked sometimes when I tell them like, no, you're, you're gonna, you're, your glucose is going to go up while you're recovering, you know, you're going to expend it all that, uh, glycogen in your muscles you know and mm-hmm. then part of the process of re re uh restocking that fuel and keeping on board close to the cells is generating glucose as part of that process right so mm-hmm. a lot of people don't realize that and then i think too because people heal up and feel better they're more active right so the amount of water you eat the amount of protein you need the amount of fat you you need is going to change over time right and I know I'm way more active now. I'm 51. How old are you? I'm 27. Ah, wow. So like, yeah, I'm almost twice as old as you. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so um, I think, uh, you know, there's that mindset of, well, you know, I'm this age and blah, 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 blah. And there's that, all that stuff that's been ingrained in us over time. It's like people your age do this or do that, you know? And uh, so I, I think we're kind of always fighting all those little ideas that have been planted in us over time. And we don't realize, because you know, weightlifting is all about your body adapting to lifting weights, right? Otherwise you wouldn't grow any muscles, right? And the same thing happens with your diet. And like I said, I think people just do more. They have more energy, right? They have more energy available. So they expend more energy. So they need more energy or they use their muscles more. So they, their muscles are getting bigger. So they need more protein to, to, to keep growing right exactly yeah yeah i mean most people that are coming into this diet coming into this diet not as like a oh let's just you know sorry let's just try out a carnivore diet see what happens they're coming to it because they have to come to it because yeah. they've tried all other options uh the medication healthcare system the diet whatever doing it before keto vegan plummet whatever it is has just stopped working or doesn't work or didn't work so they've had to fall to this diet so when they're transforming from whatever they're doing before to this they're noticing right my body's needing more of this or that and the idea that we always have to have a high fat diet is a bit a bit preposterous preposterous to be honest um and they're starting these diets with messed up low glucose levels so they're thinking right i'm just gonna eat like two chicken breasts a day and some eggs it's not gonna be enough like you, you're giving your body literally maybe 30 grams of fat yeah. Um, I don't think there's much indication for anyone to be eating anything less than maybe 100 grams of fat. Obviously, you know, it depends on your body weight and all that sort of thing. But, you know, um, and the thing is as well, like I had an interview with Bart Kay, uh, I think a couple of days ago. Mm. And I'll probably air 
uh, before the time that this one comes out. But he basically said, the majority of people that I consult with and coach fall into a diet which consists of around 66% fat and 33% protein. So essentially uh, low-grade ketosis macros. Um, and the one percent being trace carbs from whatever, I imagine. <laughs> so when I listen to that and I think, yeah, it probably is that. I mean, there is probably some suggestion that some people do better or maybe 70%, 72%, 75%, whatever, um, fat and less protein. There's also a suggestion to say that some people like us might require higher amounts of protein. So what, I'm, what stage I'm at at the moment is that I'm experimenting with different ratios for you know a fair amount of time, a few weeks, to see what happens. So I can actually say yeah. from experience, this is what happened to me mm. as an autistic person on a carnivore diet that does bodybuilding. So that might relate to one other person, but you know, at least I've right. got my own experience and you know. Well, and, and people get hung up in the the gender thing too. It's like, oh, women need more fat or blah blah blah. And and that might be the case to some degree. Um, more people you know, if you're just spending fuel most of the day and you're not really working out or whatever, you you maybe you're just the ratio is gonna lean towards fat. Um, but then, you know, when you're active and you're using a lot of muscle and it tends to tilt the other way. And I know some, uh, some girls that are, you know, your age that lift and they have high protein demands, right? So I'm a little skeptical of the, of the gender differences, you know, I mean, obviously there's a different hormone profile and all that, but we basically all make our hormones out of cholesterol anyways, right? So if, if you got the right, uh, the right stuff on board you're going to make the, the the same and and of course girls typically can't put on as much muscle as guys they're just you know they're engineered that way but when you take people that lift every day it doesn't matter if they're a guy or girl i'm pretty sure they're going to need more protein right <laughs> it doesn't matter what yeah. your gender is it doesn't matter that you're not quite as big as a guy mm -hmm. that ratio of what you need is still going to be there and i think people make that mistake they get it in their head well i'm a guy or i'm a girl i need more of this i need more of that and they're not really looking at what their body's telling them that's, that's perfect yeah like you've got some really really key points in this video which i think will really sort of um alert people you know just because you see someone promoting a high fat or high protein version of the diet doesn't mean oh i'm missing something here maybe i need to try that see where you're at now and you know, I've got a friend, um, Alicia, she's in a recent interview that I did. Um, she's quite muscular. She's like a bodybuilder, um, female, which is five foot two. Her protein requirements is a lot more than most male. Um, <laughs> See, she, perfect, you know, perfect example. Exactly. She's taking at least 200 grams of protein a day and she's five foot two. Yeah. Um, and people say, you know, it's too much. It's like, you don't know how active she is you don't know what diet she's doing yeah what she did before you don't know what she's depleting before she doesn't know what right. training she's doing right now i mean if she's doing um i don't know german volume training you know seven days a week i don't think she is but if she was <laughs> if she she's was an animal, you know, right? <laughs> you're gonna run into issues yeah Oh. Yeah, and you do run into the CrossFitters and stuff that are utterly obsessed with working out every day, and they hit it hard. And it's not just lifting; they're lifting, they're sprinting, they're, you know, going. I, I got to run a mile around the box before they get back in here and lift some more. You know, it's right. like the injury rate is for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They're always fight. Their their body wants to be more efficient so they can run and sprint, and then at the same time, they're demanding it to put more muscle on. And so there's they're fighting that that uh adaptation right one's trying to get lighter and faster and the other one's trying to get bulkier and stronger and uh, that's a yeah. tough game but but always says that when, he, when i speak to him he's like the problem with i have with a lot of people is they want to achieve lots of things at once but you've got to find your specific goal and your diet and training has to match what you want to reach for that goal and it just it, get, it flows from that um, so for, for example, if you're someone that wants to, an average person wants to bulk up and lose fat and get ripped, well, probably, probably the easiest thing to do first is bulk up, you know, at least try and gain muscle. Right. When you lose fat, it's going to be a bit easier and you're going to have the muscles already there. So you're not fighting against yourself, right. uh, lower body weight to then try and increase muscle. So, you know, there's, you got to approach things from different angles at different times and pick a goal and just stick to it.
Been... I mean, what are your goals at the moment in terms of your training? Is it strength based or? Uh, yeah, it's pr- primarily strength based. Every once in a while, somebody's like, "Come on, man, do a little more hypertrophy. Get those muscles to pop, man. You're gonna look amazing when, when you got more definition." And I'm like, "And I'll do it for a while, and I do get some results." And then I'm like, "I'm like, I, I'm not as strong as I was th- three weeks ago." So I go back to, to strength training, right? Because I'm like, ah, uh, in the back of my mind, it's like I'm always like, I wonder how far I'll get. You know, how much will I be? What will my deadlift be? What will my squat be? You know, that's the, that's the, that's the engine in the back. And I do little divergence, you know, and then realize that posterior chain is just not as strong, no matter how many muscles I get to pop. (laughs) It's like Mm -hmm. the core, the core compound movements are, are basically, uh, the thing that does that. And you get busy, um, doing all these specialty exercises to get some muscle to pop here or there, then that suffers so so then i drift back to just strength training but i enjoy it and it does keep it it does make it more interesting because you're doing these little side experiments to see if i can get yeah can i get that extra muscle on my calf you know pop out or whatever you know yeah i mean we're at a training age i mean i imagine you've been training for quite a bit longer than me but we kind of know what does and doesn't work and if we're doing something completely wrong for in my case 14 years the thing is, I've been enjoying what I've been doing for 14 years. I'm very unlikely to change it. So when someone says to me, you know, oh, Jonathan, why don't you try uh, reducing your weight or increasing your weight or whatever it is, or try drop sets or try anything different. Like, mm. I've been doing this for a long time and I have tried everything. I mean, you type in training program into Google. I've tried probably everything on that <laughs> the first 10 pages, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's how you learn, man. You know, mm. and you're right. It comes but down to what you want what what it is that really drives you that you enjoy you know what's what's the what's the uh the concentrated uh sort of curiosity or goal that that keeps you going back right and then you're always going to go back to that right so let me ask you let's let's talk about the f word how do you feel about fasting Mm, i think right so I spoke to the Steak and Butter gang coaches, Adek and Raymond recently. Mm. Their concept of fasting, um, they said so themselves, isn't really fasting. Um, so what it is, is I believe that people with very specific health problems should attempt to fast if it is necessary to them. You know, I'm not saying many people should do it. I think the idea of fasting and doing three-day fasts it's possible and it's useful for some people, but not everyone. Mm. Um, I, it depends what their goal is. Um, but I mean, people doing the, the priming, like feasting, fasting sort of thing, they are feasting and they're still full for the next two days. Cause I've eaten that much when they have eaten. So <laughs> technically they're not actually fasting. <laughs> you see what I mean? Right, right. So I, you know, it's a, it's a way of eating. And I mean, it might free up for some more of their time. So it makes their lives more efficient, but, you you got to enjoy it and you've got to eat to hunger and make sure you're getting enough in you know um a lot of us come from places where we started a diet beforehand that was inappropriate for the human species and we did not consume enough nutrients um mm-hmm. so we are in a def- deficiency mm-hmm. so some of us will have to eat more at the beginning in order to stock up reserves and absolutely up, get more on board as you say so yeah yeah that's why what do you think yeah, so I did a lot of experimenting with fasting in the beginning. I think I fasted up to like 10 days, you know, basically a water fast. Just I was curious when I learned about it, I was like, you can do this? Human beings can go without food for 10 days? And I was like, so, but I think it's a really powerful lever, but I I don't think it works for most people as a lifestyle, right? It's that lever you pull when you're sick or, you know, and I think a lot of um you know, I love the steak and butter gang. I know, I know Raymond really well. I know Bella f- fairly well. And I, I met a lot of those people in that crowd. And, and, you know, like Ray's claim to fame was he got, he got a nice six pack. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, for something like that, that's your goal to have a six pack. It probably works pretty good, you know, but for a weightlifter, I don't think it, I, you know, it's completely insufficient. I mean, you might do a restart zone or maybe you're sick and, you want to get things back on track, then then you pull that lever once in a while, maybe. 
but I haven't fasted now. I haven't even attempted to for over a year and I can't, I don't have a reason to, to, to do it again. You know what I mm. mean? So I think it's a powerful tool, but I, I don't like it as a lifestyle and it doesn't, it's not, I don't think it's aligned with the things I want to do like lift, you know, and I don't think, yeah, I mean, GHG and stuff like that will go up and, and stuff like that, but you get almost the same result from working out as you do from fasting, like the, the positive increases in hormone levels and stuff like that. Mm. It's almost, it's almost identical. And it's like, well, I'd rather work out than fast. So, and I don't do as well lifting when I fast. Right. And it kind of ripples through for a while. It's not like, Oh, just go back to eating and everything's back to normal. So, and, and I'm, a, I'm a big believer too, that, you know, people like myself that have been overweight for decades, you know, uh, I mean, carrying around a lot of extra weight. I'm not talking like, a few kilos and you know talking like 50 extra kilos or more you meet those people they've yo-yo dieted through their life trying to find the right diet trying to get leaner you know trying to get healthier and their weight went up and down up and down up and down and i think those people in particular are more susceptible to long-term disruptions from things like fasting because mm. the body wants to recover all that extra weight it thinks that that is a safe place to be like, Oh, we've got to have extra fuel on board because starvation's, you know, running amok or something like that. And then, so the set points for, you know, adipose tissue or body fat tend to be really high in those people. And so you fast them down and it's really hard for them to maintain that leaner position because their body's used to recovering all that body weight and then adding some on for more, more safety or something right so again it depends on what your goals are but i i i've kind of dismissed it as a lifestyle i try and i try and draw that line it's a powerful tool it's got its place but it's for most people i don't think it's it has the utility that a lot of people think it does because mm. i mean if you're yeah. if you just if you if you just took down a, a mammoth and you've got this giant carcass sitting in front of you why wouldn't you eat, <laughs> you know? I'm going to leave that for a few days and get my autophagy up. Then I'm going to go back to it later. <laughs> right. a later. That didn't happen, right? We're pretty sure right. they, they didn't do that. So, I mean, we're able to fast because there were times probably when there was no food and we had to go looking for it or whatever. So we tolerate that, but I don't really think it's optimal. Right? Mm -hmm. It's something we can do, but it, I think in general, it's less than optimal, but um, you could use it to recover, you know, fasting has been used to recover from all kinds of things, um, you know, digestive issues, colds and everything. And, and, and it works for stuff like that, but not as a lifestyle for, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I think the same, like you can end up depleting yourself. Um, you know, if you're like, like I said before, if you're doing the feasting, fasting thing, you're not depleting yourself because you're eating enough to maintain, say your food volume is what it would be for three days, but in one day, that's fine. It just means on those two days, you might be a bit hungry. Um, you might not be. I don't know. I've not tried it yet. So but you well, didn't get the point. Yeah. Well, I, and you notice when people are feasting, like, yeah, you got it. You got to keep eating to like, you can barely put that last uh, bite of food in your mouth and you just, you don't even want to look at it. And I'm like, uh, I see what you're doing here, but I don't want to do it because <laughs> I enjoy eating and I don't want to, I don't want to be stuffed. You know, it's like trying to go and work out when you're stuffed. It's miserable, right? I mean, yeah. you push. How, how, long, how long do you leave between your workout and your meal? Oh, sometimes I'm eating while I walk in the gym, <laughs> but yeah. but I don't. I mean, because I'm busy, right? Or I'm eating in the car on the way to the gym mm. or, or whatever. But I'm not stuffed, and so it doesn't bother me, right? And mm. sometimes I'm eating all right all the, on the way out. I let my hunger dictate when I eat, right? So, um. Like I said, in the early days and I'm, you know, throwing down pre-workouts and protein shakes and all this stuff. And I'm miserable at working out in the morning. It's like my stomach's all turned upside down, uh, you know, now I just eat meat uh, whenever I'm hungry and it never bothers me. Yeah. I've, I always find everyone says that, like everyone eats intuitively on this sort of diet. They find you eat what you want, that you desire to your satiety, then everything sort of sorts itself out. Um, and it, it sounds just like that. I mean, it might be that some days you eat three meals, some days, five meals, some days, two meals, some days, maybe even one meal if you're very busy. So mm -hmm. your body will just sort itself out. And like the amount of time I'm spending right now in front of the computer screen, making videos and cranking out different topics and interviews people, I'm 
struggling to find time to put in four meals um is when i usually do five that four meals though um it's i have to set a reminder on my phone i'll eat now or i'll forget yeah. the thing is i'm i'm someone that can get carried away with whatever i do so i'll be the sort of person that's at my computer screen for two days and not eat mm. um so i try to stay on track of things because i know what my my character's like my behavior's like so i get very wrapped up in it all. so yeah and I think that's the thing we've been training. It's easy to skip meals. Like, you know, people have all kinds of tricks, like drink a bunch of water and you you won't be so hungry or drink coffee, you know, with cream in it. And then, you know, there's a million tricks and everybody's thought if you want to get leaner, you got to eat less and move more. Right. That's, that's, that's back in the back of somebody's mind. And then when you tell them, well, if I eat uh, as much as I want and I eat five times a day, I get leaner faster than if I cut calories, you know, because, I mean, it's easy long-term to maybe you're eating 5% less than you're burning or something. That's easy. Like, most people can do that because you're, especially when you're eating frequently, you're very comfortable. But let's try and cut, you know, I mean, I'm, a big day for uh, my biggest day ever, I was probably like 10,000 calories. Mm. I don't have time to eat that much food. It's <laughs> a job know? at that point. Uh, north of probably 4,000, 5,000 calories is a job. Yeah, it is. And I'm typically at at least 4,500. I mean, when I was sick with COVID laying in bed, I was at like 3,800 calories a day, just laying in bed, you know? Mm. So, um, an active day, you know, it's going to be five, six, 7,000 is no, is no big deal. Especially you could do two workouts in a day. That yeah. always adds to it. Like, um, you're someone with a fair bit of muscle mass. So, the amount of energy that you're expending when you're working out and just sat, sat there rest same with me is is way more I, I mean if i went for a right run on the treadmill um i can't but if i did then you know like a thousand calories in half an hour or whatever it is you know it's a ridiculous amount of energy just to just keep up with you know yeah or just to go you know i shop in a really big store and it's like cruising around throwing meat in my cart and by the time I get out of there, it's like six or seven thousand steps. <laughs> it's, that was, mm. and that's like all I was doing was shopping, right? All I was doing was buying food, and you add that on top of a couple workouts, and then sometimes at work, most of my time at work, I, I drive a desk, but I might be unloading a truck that's full of steel or something, you know, or I might be loading packing tools, putting them in a the truck, taking them to a job site and then bringing them back or something like that an occasional day like that it's it's going to be eight nine ten thousand calories right there mm. you know you can add that it's all these extra movements you do and people don't think of that i mean when i've worked a full-time job where i was in retail um yeah to keep up with my weight i'd eat about 6k calories a day and that was a chore my digestion wasn't great and it's almost mm. like you have to find find the balance and like the amount you're expending and the amount you're eating then the amount you're sleeping and covering, I try to link all these things together in my interviews to think, make people mm -hmm. think. Um, don't just focus on, oh, I need to eat 7,000 calories a day to gain muscle. What's your sleep like? Are you able to sleep with that 7,000 calories or not? No, okay. Write that idea off, get your sleep up, then everything else can follow suit. So I like to get that idea across myself anyway. Yeah, and that's a common problem with the autistic community is people have very irregular sleeping patterns or sleeping disorders is, are very common that's something that i've dealt with uh, myself and been working on for years and my quality of sleep has gotten quite high but i don't spend much time asleep <laughs> there's like not much i can mm -hmm. do about it right but i have blackout curtains i got it you know what a chili pad is yeah it's, it's like a cold mat thing yeah, yeah i've got that i wear earplugs um the everything i can think of uh, i weighted blankets i found a, a weighted blanket that's actually full of glass beads and oh, it helps yeah. you stay cool it doesn't it doesn't trap the heat in but it gives you that and i don't know what that is it's not really just an autistic thing but some people when they sleep with that weighted blanket it just is very relaxing it just v helps you fall asleep faster i've heard that maybe it sort of um simulates like a hug or something i don't know it is it is Pressure, very much maybe. like that yeah if you watch that movie about temple grandin she's a famous autistic lady and famous mm -hmm. in the cattle industry she she built built a squeeze chute like they use for the cattle 
to flip the cows over and and, and look at their hooves and stuff like that because she noticed that that it relaxed them when they they were in this device mm. and so she used to do that to calm down so there's something going on there we kind of we kind of understand how what the result is but not ex exactly how it works let's say so i do all that to try and sleep better i i do i did my doctors i was giving me some kind of drug or something to take and i sleep a little more but um, I seem that's the thing about karma. You seem to recover so fast. I think mm. a lot of the data on just how much you can work out and how fast you recover and when you should hit again, again, your body adapts. And when you've got all the right elements on board, your body just recovers really fast and you're able to work out more, yeah. which in a way is kind of like the point of, you know, the, the anabolic steroids and stuff is really what they do is help you recover faster. Right. Mm. So I'd like to think at least that we're moving in that direction just by eating meat, you know. We can get yeah, so it seems like we're getting a lot closer and touching on the point you made about sleep. Um I noticed the stricter I am in terms of having a carnivore diet, as in the closer I get to, you know, meat and water and salt. I've not done that one yet, but it's on it's on the cards maybe for a week or so. But, um yeah, I, I sleep a lot less. Um, but my quality of sleep is much, much better. I mean, I can get what I used to get. I could feel, wake up feeling like I used to feel when I'd get eight hours, but do that in five hours. Right. And biggest thing for me in terms of improving sleep quality has been emitting the blue light. So mm. my screen on my phone, um, between certain hours of the day, it will go black and white, completely nothing, like no color at all. Uh. And that's made a really big difference to me. Um, so it might just be that I'm more photosensitive. I don't know. Uh, it might be that you have, I mean, I, I'm, I'm heat sensitive as well, but it might be that you have issues of heat. So the, you know, the, the cold blankets and things like that will help. Um, white noise seems to help me. So there's loads of options people have and you just got to pick and choose and find what's going to work for you, I think. Yeah, I use a lot of red light bulbs. So like mm. the lights I use in the evening are all red. I started that a long time ago, that was like one of the first tips I got, you know, cut down on the blue light and use the red light. So I've had that and I think it does help. I mean, one of my issues in general is that I'm, I easily get overstimulated because I, I visually, I get overstimulated, um, tactile sensations, noises, everything, you know? And so I know everything for me is controlling my environment to, uh, lower those levels of excitement. So, because if I can't go to sleep, that's usually what it is. Something's got me excited, stimulated. Yeah, I mean, it sounds probably sounds peculiar to people watching this. Like, how does that bother you? You know, you got to think well, our senses tend to be heightened. So, what I know for myself is, if I do a reaction speed test, my reaction speeds are usually about double what the next person would be. Mm. Um, and I'm not a Superman or anything. You know, I'm not made of magic, but um, it does seem that everything around me is louder brighter um sensations feel rougher i can't tolerate touching uh fluffy blankets anything like that any sort of feathery feel i don't like um that's just me but all autistic people are very different and we'll have different things which just don't appeal to us it's very hard to explain in a, in a video but it doesn't feel right like, it doesn't feel natural right yeah no it's a big deal i mean the, the clothes i select the sheets i sleep on you know, all that is like, it's got to be, it's got to feel right, whatever it is. Like some things are too soft. Some things are just, and it, it, I think part of it is a lot of us don't have that filter. So we can't, we can't start ignoring it. Like most people do. Like I've worked with people that can handle all kinds of background noise and conversation and they're still focused and concentrating and all that background noise is filtered out. And I don't, so I got earplugs, headphones, you know, whatever I need. Same thing at the gym. Um, I've been making jokes on Facebook about the power went out at the gym the other night and I was like, finally mm -hmm. the music stopped. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. 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 One so... thing for me that's changed on the carnival diet is that I no longer need to wear earphones or headphones in say a cinema or in a noisy bar or anything like that. You know, mm. you'll think, you know, why'd you do that? Things are loud, honestly. And the way that the thing is it will elicit an impact on your body. And it'll be psychosomatic. So your body, will, your heart will go up, your senses mm -hmm. will pick up. It's mm -hmm. almost like everything becomes more 
like everything's like rushing on you like a imagine being like shook in a, in a snow globe or something that's the best way i can describe it mm, yeah that's and, a good analogy yeah so when when you're living in in that that little snow globe that little glass bottle you're you're really wrecked and i've noticed that i don't need headphones anymore mm. that's been quite big on for me like my body's a lot calmer now and i experience what people can uh, i think they call it the carnivore zen i mean have you, have you had that yet or yeah mm. yeah i it's less distressing for me for sure um so i do i do tolerate louder places much easier um they're they're because it's not distressing it's not that i can't it's not that i can filter out all the noise but the the input isn't raising my my excitement level or my anxiety level like it used to so and and it's interesting because you mentioned it raises your heart rate right and that was a trick for me in figuring out what was going on with sleep quality sleep the amount same amount but one night was better than the other and it's pretty clearly that the faster your sleeping heart rate drops below your daytime resting heart rate, the better quality of the sleep. So if it goes down, it stays down and it's your resting, your nighttime resting heart rate is nice and low, you recover faster. And that seems to be facilitated quite nicely by carnivore. Completely. Yeah. And for, for me at least staying cool like let, let my body temperature get right down before bed mm. so i've been having like um, a few cubes of ice in my drink before bed a bit, like mm. a glass of water whatever, and that's cool my body down a little bit and that's let me sleep better and the same with if i have a hot shower my body will then counteract that hot shower the heat mm -hmm. and make my core temperature colder so when i actually go to sleep i i hit it and i'm, like, I'm out sort of thing so yeah i've had I had some quite interesting experiences on this diet and it's definitely amplified what I was already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things become so much clearer, you know, mm -hmm. I think because when you cut out so much uh, of the irritating or the things that make you sick and then this, what, what you're left to focus on becomes so much clearer, you know, mm -hmm. and that is the elimination diet aspect of it. Right. Yeah. You're taking a lot of the things that generate a lot of noise out of the out of the equation, and then you're able to focus on specific things. It's very clear when you ate too much fat or didn't eat enough, or you ate enough protein, didn't eat enough protein. You can mm -hmm. focus on those fundamentals and not worry about the fact that that black pepper screwed up your stomach. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, so before I wrap this up, what would be your one piece of key advice to a fellow autistic carnivore or someone about to start the diet? Well, I, I, you know, I try and preface everything by saying that I think it brings a higher quality of life to everybody because there's so much involved. I mean, where do you start? Um, oh, by the way, you're going to get rid of heartburn. Like, well, that's nice, you know, but <laughs> you're, you, you probably sleep better. Oh, that's nice. But I mean, how long, how it's so hard to explain all those details and, and how many anecdotes we've heard. I just try and sum it up like it's better quality of life. You probably mm. be healthier. You probably need less medication. You spend less time in, in, in an anxious state and you'll be able to engage and enjoy life and be in the moment and not be distressed by the overwhelming sort of inputs from your environment. Right. Mm. So I, that's a great question. And I'm always kind of like, how do you best answer that? Right. Cause you're in that same in that niche where it's like autistic carnivores really is that really a thing you know and it's like what does one possibly have to do with the other right it seems so obscure i get it it seems really obscure um to people from the outside who are not familiar with either one so much you know mm. it's hard to explain why they would come together but Clearly, I mean, you've seen the group. There's a lot of people in there, and there's a lot of people who are willing to talk talk about how the great success they've had just by eating more meat and eating less of the other stuff. You know. So, so, Tom, how can people find this group? Um, oh, it's yeah. on Facebook, isn't it? Yeah. Um. So it's a Facebook group called um, Autistic Carnivores, just like it sounds. And then I have a Meat Mosaic group too, which is just kind of um, for people that are fans of the YouTube channel. You know, it's like post the videos in there, talk to people, you know, just kind of a little community thing. I have a bunch of other Facebook groups. Um, 
some of them are just there for fun or whatever. So that's where I know a lot of people from. I just started making Facebook groups for different purposes, you know, because yeah. some people were keto and carnivore and a lot of people came from keto to carnivore. So there's kind of a group for that. And then we used to make a joke that if the government's going to restrict our our meat consumption, we we should uh, use a religious exemption. So we we started the meat cult. So <laughs> that's our that's that's where uh, carnivores go to church. <laughs> mostly Brilliant. poke fun but, yeah, yeah. Oh, what's, what's the best way people to get hold of you if they want to um well i'm on facebook i'm just thomas clark thomas allen clark or you can you can message me you know send me uh messages on on youtube if you're watching one of the videos you can post in there i try and i try and get back to everybody eventually um you know uh, my uh if you go to instagram you can find Thomas Allen Clark on Instagram. My link tree's there. It's got all my social media links. Um, you can find my videos. There's usually links to everything in my videos, you know. So I got a YouTube channel like like you do called Meat Mosaic. So, and I'm I'm pretty easy to find because I I try and stay in touch with a lot of other carnivores. So I know a lot of the other people, and that's so. Uh, like you said, you were just, you know, autism carnivore came up and when you were talking to Sean Baker and he, you know, immediately associated that with me. So, yeah, you know, he's been supportive of, of that because he has a, he has a kid that's autistic. So he's, mm. he's, he's kind of a young adult now, but uh, so that was a cause close to his heart. And I think he was kind of glad that I, I did it because he's way too busy to, to start another, to do something else. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's inspiring. Um, I'm glad I've had the chance to have you on today and just go over what what it is for someone that's an autistic carnival that's been doing it for quite a few years now. You know, um, it's been very enlightening and educational, to be honest. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, and I've learned a lot from you, too, mostly just from you know, exchanging posts with you online and, and uh, trying to make some time to watch some more of your videos. So, um. But that's mm -hmm. the thing about having a community. Like we're always, I mean, whether it's behind the scenes stuff, like we were talking about recording videos and editing and all that stuff, help each other with that. But most of, most importantly, help each other have a better quality of life, you know, just mm -hmm. by sharing our experiences and our experiments and, <laughs> and yeah. sometimes our mistakes. <laughs> I love that. Thanks yeah. so much for coming on. I appreciate you. Yeah, likewise. It was great meeting you and I look forward to working with you some more.